Thank you. It's great to be here. I've had an opportunity to talk to several of you this morning, and I have to say I'm very impressed with the level of participation in the uh, conference and the level of the participants. Um, in technology, we're often meant to be disruptive. We're meant to shake things up, but I don't think we're supposed to shake things up this way. <laughs> so I hope that we won't shape things up that way, but we'll continue to disrupt and be disruptive in the, in the way that we've all come to know. Um, I want to be, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I've got some things to talk about, some of which are related to online learning, some of which are related to more recent developments in technology and automation. My background, can we bring the presentation up? They're working on it. My background is in online teaching and learning research. I've done research on online learning for more than 20 years. Um, I'm in the School of Education where we have online programs that date back to the 1990s. I started teaching an online program in 1998 myself. So some of what I have done is sort of an historical record of uh, investigation. And a lot of this research can be found at this website. It's that, called the How People Learn online website. It's sunyresearch.net, How People Learn. All of the publications that, I've, that were referenced in the introduction are here. Uh, these publications have generated about 8,000 citations in the scholarly literature. Uh, there are many different examples of uh, studies of how people learn in online environments. And a lot of what we've discovered can be summed up by this one diagram, uh, the sort of instructional design, facilitation of discourse, and direct instruction, the quality of those allow instructors to create an environment where students feel that they can project themselves as real people, that they can connect with others as real people, and those contribute to variance in how much students learn. Reports of high uh, levels of learning are predicted by instructional design organization facilitation to discourse direct instruction. So teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive presence. So I thought I wanted to get that out of the way. I think that sums up most of what I know about how people learn in online environments. And there's a lot you can uh, pick up by reading some of the other materials on that website I just mentioned. More recently, I've become interested in the effects of the effects of automation on human cognition and human learning. And some of the um, books that have influenced my thinking include this book, The Rise of the Robots, um, The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr, who also wrote an excellent book called The Shallows. I don't know if anybody's heard of The Shallows. Great book. Um, and The Second Machine Age by Eric Bernjols and David McAfee. They also have a, another new book out called Platforms, Machines, and uh, Learning. I think it's a, t together these, this is getting a hard time, this was working this earlier. Together they present some interesting and potentially concerning information about the effects of automation. But before we start with that, how many people know who this is? Have you ever seen this, this man before? That's Arthur Samuels, and this is a picture of Arthur Samuels, the father of modern data and computing. He's writing a program in Checker to, to create a pro checkers program that can beat him in checkers. This is, in, again, in 1956. So he was successful at writing this program that could beat him, and we've gone on and done this again and again. Uh, machines, machines can learn, right? They can, they can learn how to do things. And some of the things that machines have learned how to do include these, reading and writing, speaking and listening, looking at things and integrating knowledge. There's a good example of this was Watson. How many people remember Watson on Jeopardy? Yeah, Watson, IBM's uh, artificial intelligence uh, computer, computing system beat the uh, champions of Jeopardy soundly and led to, to this acknowledgement. I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords from Brad. Um, so 
what we're seeing is not only developments like that a few years ago with IBM's Watson being able to beat people at natural la la language processing and answering questions on the fly. Um, IBM has spawned, IBM's Watson has spawned these other uh, sort of innovations, um, tech support, health administration, global imaging. It also, I th found uh, they're using this image processing to identify new Nazca lines in Peru. Uh, some interesting stuff that's been happening quite recently with the advancement in automation and these newer things that com computers can do. Another example of things that computers can do is drive cars, right? So we see Google and Waymo developing these self-driving cars. And it represents some interesting and challenging developments. These cars have driven more than a million miles. They've, they've driven across bridges, they've inched through traffic, they've gotten on and off highways. And they've, not, they've done that without a whole lot of problems. They, there was, there's been a couple of accidents. One was a relatively serious accident with a, with a death with a, when the safety driver wasn't paying attention, was, was looking at their t cell phone. And one set of problems is when they encounter human beings. Human beings tend to act irrationally relative to what computers do. People will pull up to an intersection and vie for advantage to get into the intersection. The computers are frozen. They don't know what to do. The, the self-driving cars become paralyzed. I don't know what you do with these humans. They're, they're problematic. So they've been driving these cars, and someday we're going to have self-driving cars. Someday we're going to have self-driving taxis. Probably we'll start with taxis, probably start with delivery. This is an interesting quote by William Gibson. The future's arrived. It's just not equally distributed. That future of self-driving cars has been going on already. There's been self-driving taxis for more than a year, and they've driven 100,000 trips to 1,500 monthly subscribers to that service. It's not coming in the future. It's now. So after that accident, we probably think, well, they've got the self-driving cars. They're probably still on a test stage where they are keep a safety driver with the self-driving car until we get that figured out, right? It would be crazy after one accident to, to have that be going on. It's, but they're not using safety drivers. They're using self-driving cars with no safety drivers. And it's relatively new. This must be short trips, right? It can't be that dangerous or that extensive. But it is. It's been going on. UPS has been delivering packages for more than a year. Nobody knew. They drive packages and deliver packages in Phoenix and in Arizona. They drive a 115-mile route with nobody in the car delivering packages. So, well, it's relatively small, 115 miles, it's relatively local. That's what, what, what harm could that do, right? That's not how it's going on. This truck just drove across the United States from California to Pennsylvania with nobody in it and delivered dairy products. So the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed and not everybody knows that it's here. Um, so another example of things that computers can do is they can see, right? They can see faces. Facebook developed software that can recognize faces only one quarter of one percent less accurately than human beings can. That was a few years ago. And you can see some of the 3D modeling that went into their development of, of that facial recognition technology. So, a few years ago, they were a quarter percent bet, uh, worse than humans. Now, they're, now it's better. Now the facial recognition technology is actually better than humans. In around 2016, that happened. So computers can see. They can integrate knowledge. They can drive cars. They can recognize face, faces. And those technologies have been used in a relatively wide range of applications. The facial recognition technology is being used to prevent retail crime, unlock phones, 
do smarter advertising, find missing people. So there's a wide range of very helpful applications to these um, developments. Not all of them are so helpful. So we've got a giant surveillance state being developed in China based on facial recognition technologies, which is, has some people concerned. This computer vision system is tied to a social credit system that tightly monitors and rewards and penalizes citizens according to their behavior. And it could potentially spill over outside of China. So computers can see, they can drive, computers can also write, right? So what can they write? Things like hello world or blah, blah, blah. Well, they're writing articles every day. The Washington Post has a robot reporting program called Heliograph. In its first year, it produced 650 articles and earned the, earned the Post an award for excellence in use of bots from its work on the 2016 election coverage. And readers don't know which, program, which stories are written by people and which stories are written by computers. There's other developments. Computers can speak. This is a Microsoft researcher giving us talk in China while his speech is simultaneously being broadcast in English and in Chinese on the fly with his voice as both uh, sources. So his voice in English and his voice in Chinese simultaneously. It's a, a, a very rapid area of development, uh, human speech translation. So all these developments have spawned entirely new innovations and new industries. Um, industries and these different areas in finance, manufacturing, medical, diagnostics. So there's no doubt there's been great advances made and great progress made, but there's also been some concern. Traditionally, labor productivity and other metrics of human progress are kind of go hand in hand. So labor productivity, real GDP per capita, private employment, and medium family income all have t over historically have gone up in, in tandem. There's been a high correlation between them. Around 2000, with the introduction of computing and automation, we started to see a separation of that. This is called the great decoupling by Eric Byrne Jolson and David McAfee um, between labor productivity, between productivity and these other indices of human uh, well-being. Some folks think that this is a function of computers taking over position, jobs from people and leaving less of the pie for humans and more of the pie for companies that produce the automation. So leaving that aside for a minute, this is not happening with um, online learning, right? My area of, of interest is online learning. Well, here's what Sebastian Thrun said a few years ago. Udacity is my response to the development of AI. The mission I have to educate everybody really is an attempt to delay what AI will eventually do to us because I honestly believe humans should have a chance. So Sebastian Thrun, I don't know if you remember, he was a, a, a high level executive in, in Google who started uh, Udacity, the massive open online course platform. He sees potentially the threats of AI. So. I think there's been tremendous progress and tremendous human advancement, but there's also been some concerns about what AI can and may do to, human, to humans and to society. There's been some interesting other work. Humans are underrated by Jeff Colvin, I think, is an interesting one. And he's talking about, in this book, what humans can do that machines can't do. And I think this gets back to where I want, what I want to talk to when I'm talking about teaching and learning in online settings. And Colvin talks about learning being a complex human ability. Learning being cognitive, social, psychological, developmental, effective. And there are certain domains in which humans can outperform machines. And Eric Bernjolson and David McAfee give us this, this insight. We should be racing with machines, not against machines. So there are applications of this when we start to think about teaching and learning and online learning specifically. One example that 
uh, Byrne, Jolson, and McAfee provide is that humans working with computing systems can beat purpose-built standalone programs that, that have traditionally beat humans in chess. So humans plus machines beat machines by themselves. So it's sort of an interesting opportunity for educators to think about it. And we, I think we can think about it in this way. We've got people up on top of Bloom's taxonomy with abilities for creating, evaluating, and analyzing. And artificial intelligence can be thought of as a tool for application and understanding. And other technologies can be used for search and remembering and retrieval. So there's opportunities, I think, to work with machines to achieve these goals. I'm going to skip over this one. So I think the Not sure what that is. Okay. I think when we think about what possibilities that artificial intelligence computing has, we, th we have to think with, about ourselves. We have agency and can make choices, and we shouldn't be accepting automation blindly. We should start with our own teaching practices and be reflective about what we're doing and ask ourselves what are we giving up and what are we gaining through the use of technology? What are we giving up, giving up and what are we gaining? Um, one way to think about this is that there are humanistic values for learning. Learning is done in communities and communities reflect values. Values can be instrumental or generative. Um, Mitch Resnick at MIT talks about this in his book, Learning to Code and Coding to Learn. He says he's more interested in the Scratch community as an affinity space where people gain valuable opportunities to take on new kinds of identities, identities as contributors, identities as people um, who code and, and, and grow through their participation in the community. And Resnick says this, I think there's a real risk that we as a society are going to end up giving too much privilege to the types of knowledge and types of activity that are most easily evalu evaluated computationally. So the issue is what people tend to learn is what we tend to test. And if what we test is what can be tested computationally, we end up losing a lot of the valuable um, opportunities for teaching and learning. Resnick talks about the Scratch community as um, advocating a community of practice approach in which students engage in authentic activities and learning skills, more complex strategies, and even values. Skills like dividing complex problems into simpler parts, um, refining designs, and identifying and fixing bugs. Strategies like solving problems, communicating complex or abstract ideas, and designing projects. Values like sharing and giving credit and collaboration, perseverance. Those are things that machines don't tip, tip, you know, typically do. They, they're not geared toward that. Another way to view the opportunities for teaching and learning in the age of artificial intelligence is to think about empathy. So millions of years of evolution have kind of hardwired us for empathy. We're, em we're empathic. We, can, we can't help it. Um, students value empathy. Online education should, I think, prioritize empathic teaching. Another way to look at this is, I think, through the eyes of George Siemens. Folks know George Siemens at the University of Texas Arlington. He asked these questions. Does it foster creativity and personal expression? And does it develop learners to contribute to formation as a person? I think these are important questions for us to keep in mind as we are increasingly in engaged with technology and automation. Okay. I think. I'm Oh, guys, up. Oh. I was warned about this. So I think there are places where humans excel. 
Um, this is from Burns, Jolson, and McAfee's most recent book, Digital Technologies Do a Poor Job of Satisfying Our Most Social Drives. Work that taps into these drives will continue to be done by people. Tasks that require empathy, leadership, teamwork, and coaching are among those that will hold promise for humans going forward. So what do we do knowing this? One thing you can do is to be an online instructor who does these sorts of things. These recommendations are based on something called the Gallup-Purdue Index. We have good evidence that the social motivational effect of dimensions of teaching and learning really matter to our students. These are called the big six because they're powerful enduring effects on students. So being an online, being a professor, an online professor that makes students excited about learning, cares about students, encourages, encourages students to pursue their goals and dreams, assigns long-term projects and the like, actually has a powerful effect on uh, other outcomes. So when students experience those big six um, characteristics from their faculty, they also um, have better outcomes, including time to degree. Okay. And subsequent well-being and subsequent professional development and engagement. So those kinds of characteristics when they're expressed by faculty have long-term consequences for, for students. And these are activities that humans are particularly well suited to. So what should we do with online learning to make it better than the classroom according to the research literature? I think that's one of the questions that we can continually need to ask ourselves. Technology holds promise to elevate what we've done in the past and to improve upon it. If we think about t technology as a tool, we wouldn't hand out hand saws to people and expect them to uh, compete with carpenters who have electric tools. Um, so there are opportunities. There's meta-analytic evidence about what we should be doing. In 2005, Zhao and his colleagues looked at this and I thought one of the best meta-analysis meta to, up to that date. And what they found was publication year for the studies that looked at online learning and classroom instruction was sort of a, a, an important factor. And that year, 2000, 1998, corresponds with the year that learning management systems came on the scene and two-way interaction between students and teachers and distance learning became much more prevalent. So you can see that one of the things that matters is being involved. Instructor involvement in this meta-analysis was also found to be a significant contributor to making online learning better than classroom learning. So the use of LMS, two-way interaction, and high levels of involvement on part of the instructor result in better outcomes in online learning relative to the classroom. So this human interaction matters to students. Students report higher levels of satisfaction and higher levels of learning when there's higher levels of interaction between students and teachers and students and students. These interaction types are summarized here, about a half a standard deviation um, it, with, with student to student interaction and uh, improvement over classroom instruction. That's, so how do we enact these opportunities where human interaction and student-to-student -student interaction and student-teacher interaction and student-content interaction are at the forefront, are foregrounded. I think one of the interesting um, resources that can be used is this um, Teaching Online Pedagogical Repository from the University of Central Florida. Is anybody familiar with UCF's efforts in this area? They have this online repository of practices, best practices um, that s support students in terms of co course content, interaction, and assessment. And it's an extensive repository of best practices that can be used for the design and improvement of online coursework based on, this, based on this research that I was just presenting. So you see using discussion prompts to facilitate discussion, implementing 
these are just examples of sort of the uh, best practice recommendations that they have with um, links to more information about those. So what we know about online learning, there's been 17, at, at the, about 17 meta-analyses to this date um, that indicate it can be as good or better. To make it better requires that we align assessment with instruction, promote interaction, build a sense of learning community, support self-regulated learning, replace lectures with more active learning, identify big picture goals and big ideas in the discipline and inform faculty about learner status and progress and risks. So what is the role of AI in all of this? If we're gonna work with machines instead of against machines, what role does AI play? And I think there is a good role for AI and this is from Educause's recent work on artificial intelligence and higher education. And their recommendations and descriptions include institutional support, student support, and instructional support. Institutions are increasingly using artificial intelligence in marketing and recruitment efforts, admissions and enrollment, curricular and resource planning. In student support, they're using it for guidance, just-in-time financial aid when students have insufficient funds and they may be just a little short of money. They can be identified and offered small microloans that allow them to be retained. And for early warning systems, so we know when students are not logging into a course, uh, they can be identified and instructor uh, notified. There's also increasing use of artificial intelligence for self-paced progress, personalized learning and pedagogical improvement. I've seen some very recent examples of tools where artificial intelligence has been used to facilitate discussion among larger groups of students in online courses. So I think if I was to revise the model that I initially presented, I think there's a place both for humans and artificial intelligence at the highest levels of Bloom's taxonomy and that Increasingly, artificial intelligence represents an opportunity for enhancing our ability to facilitate higher levels of learning and critical thinking, creating, evaluating, and analyzing. So at that point, I'll just stop and take questions if folks have any. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you for your attention. Got a microphone for questions. I, I, I wanted to, in, in your research, um, how, how are students being prepared? I mean, everybody assumes because every student has a smartphone and, and you know, uh, 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 technology is so um, uh, uh, so, so widespread, if you will. Um, uh, that students are ready to take an online course. And we have found that, that that's not the case, particularly for students who are first generation, low income, think the digital divide is, is alive and well. So, so how, how do you, uh, in your research, have you found, particularly for low income, first generation students uh, and their ability to be successful using cost management systems uh, and be able to successfully uh, 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 navigate, if you will, the technology piece of an online course? I think it's a good question, and I appreciate that. Uh, we've done quite a bit of research on the effects of engagement or participation in online learning at the community college level, especially among first-generation students, among students of color, and we've found, I think as you're suggesting, that those students do tend to struggle. Community college students, there's a, a, a large literature, a large and emerging literature on the struggles that community college students uh, experience in online environments. Um, students tend to have lower GPAs, they tend to have slightly um, lower uh, course grades, and at the course level, students are struggling. What's interesting is there's sort of a paradox, and um, the Chronicle of Higher Education highlighted some of our work and talked about this as the, the online paradox, the online education paradox, in which they're doing worse at the course level with lower grades, but better at the program level, getting through 
their college degrees at higher rates than others they would otherwise with, in the absence of online learning. So there's sort of a mystery to untangle, and I think it's the opportunity that students have in terms of the uh, number of courses that they can take because they're available online. They can d sort of increase their course load and benefit. Shauna Smith Jaggers, who's on the editorial board of the journal that I am editor of, has done a lot of work in this area, and she's got some very interesting ideas about what kind of additional student supports need to be in place in institutions that are heavily online, and institutions that are dealing with first generation students. And um, so I think it, it sort of supports the question that you're asking what do we need to do in order to not only help these students? Um, you know, get through course, get through a program quicker, but to succeed at the course level, I think that's a, still a, an unanswered question because like, study after study is showing that at the course level, students tend to be, do slightly worse. Other questions? Good morning. Good morning. Um, there was a, a slide uh, that you showed about um, robots writing articles in the Washington Post, right? So my daughter's a writer, and she may have to switch careers somewhere down the road, right? But I was thinking about, and I don't know if anything has been done in this area, because you've indicated that we've had trucks driving across country, and a lot of folks don't know about that, right? Yeah. We've had these self-driving vehicles, and a lot of people don't know that it's already happening. Um, do you foresee where AI or technology will be teaching online courses and removing faculty and humans from that interaction, and is it already taking place and we don't know about it? Um, it I think that's an interesting question, and my entire presentation is meant to be, how do we avoid that happening? You know, <laughs> what is the pedagogical sort of value system that we need to adopt sort of, you know, worldwide in a sense yeah. to avoid having um, the things that computers are good at being the things that curriculum is about. So the, I, I did my doctoral work in curriculum instruction, and it's an interesting sort of obscure area for many people, but the central question of curriculum is what's worth knowing, right? Mm -hmm. What is worth knowing? And if we start to hand off to, to artificial intelligence computer systems, what's worth knowing is what they can test, what artificial intelligence and intelligent tutoring systems can test. And they can't test everything. They can't test things that humans are good at. Um, so is it happening? Yeah, I think it is happening. Intelligent tutoring systems are sort of, um, you know, this ideal that many uh, corporations would like to get into to be able to replace the most, the highest cost in any educational organization is the cost of instruction. If we could reduce the cost of instruction, we'd be much more efficient. and. But yeah, it's happening. And I think we need to fight against it. And we need to uh, own the value system that will prohibit that from, or prevent that from happening. So yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have one. Uh, so I want to ask about the data analytics and the learning analytics and how, uh, how can we ensure, if it's possible to ensure, that uh, th th this information, this data, doesn't become part of the person, just like we have the worry of health analytics, right, becoming part of the whole scenario of the, the individual and not being able to get insurance as a result of what we know. So yeah. I'll leave you There's with that. Tre tremendous privacy issues that are raised by all of these applications of technology. And what can we do about it? Again, we have agency and we can make decisions. and. We don't have to accept this blindly, uh, but I think your point is uh, incredibly important that all of the applications of intelligent, uh, of artificial intelligence open up Pandora's boxes of, of consequences if we're not careful about it. A University of Albany alum, yay. <laughs> um. I have a concern, and I'm interested in, in your views on it. Uh, on the one hand, we know theoretically we should be going towards comp competency-based learning. And, and yet there are restrictions in terms of how our universities are structured and how regulations are, are, are involved here. 
how should we walk that fine line between where we should be going and where we can be going because of all these regulations? And just get your views on that. That's a good question. <laughs> I, th I think uh, competency-based education represents one opportunity for an educational model, I, but I, I don't think it's the only uh, opportunity for all educational models. I think it works in certain disciplines and in certain areas and in certain institutional types, but I wouldn't say that we all want to be Western Governors University. I think that there are benefits to the more traditional uh, ways that, that teaching and learning have been carried out in higher education for generations. I think, again, I would get back to the idea that these tools do represent powerful um, opportunities for enhancing what human beings can do. One example um, I think that to me was impressive is the use of artificial intelligence to help with peer-to-peer -peer learning or peer grading systems. As we try to ramp up online learning, we're seeing the need to potentially have larger course sizes and a diminishment of a learner-centered model of teaching and learning with and a more content-centered or more assessment-centered. But these new um, artificial intelligence applications are allowing uh, teachers, professors, faculty to see where students engage in more serious ways and are more able to provide peer feedback and reward those students for their more sophisticated peer feedback and identify students who aren't taking it seriously so that new kinds of grouping for peer-to-peer -peer learning can be uh, enacted. But I, th I think, you know, the opportunity is in using, is working with these technologies and that's just one sim simple example. There are other examples of new uses of artificial intelligence that I think um, support discursive models of teaching and learning, models of teaching and learning that are based on human to human interaction, but making that more efficient and effective. I'm not sure if I got exactly at your question, but okay, thanks. Um, one question that comes up in my mind is, uh, how does the online learning environment is affecting um, the teaching when there is such an emphasis on increasing productivity of faculty members? And I imagine in some ways technology is opening doors to exploring angles of the learner um, that maybe in a face-to-face -face environment you don't quite necessarily see or deal with. and so. It almost seems like the number of doors now, the opportunities to uh, explore how the learner works are increasing and as, uh, as such, how is that affecting the ability of the faculty to spend the time doing that when at the same time faculty are being asked to be more productive? Yeah, I think you're right. I think that there's, the use of technology is opening doors, especially in online environments where the entire record of discourse is always available and can be reviewed at any time that al allows us to see teaching and learning processes that are ultimately lost in face-to-face -face traditions of teaching and learning which are largely oral uh, mm. traditions. Um, this recording of all of the aspects of, on of teaching and learning provide data for gaining insights into how students learn and how best to teach them. It provides data to understand who is being advantaged and who may be being disadvantaged in, in classrooms. So I, I, I think that there's all kinds of opportunities for gaining greater insight. Um, so I, I agree with the, the implication of the question. I just feel that the uh, workload issue for faculty probably is also plays an important role. You can imagine sometimes a faculty member be seeing the opportunity to go deeper but not being able to do it, considering the uh, uh, number of, uh, I think the online teaching uh, initially perhaps was seen as something easier to do, but I imagine that uh, in reality it's actually uh, quite demanding on, on the faculty members. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there has been, a, you know, 
I, I think students initially looked at online courses as easier to do and found out that they're not easier to do, that in fact they can be harder to do, they require greater levels of self-regulation, they require more focus, more attention, uh, more proactivity on the parts of students. And I, you know, I do agree with you that faculty tend to feel that they work harder in online courses, that there's more work involved, and that the, again, I think you're right, the opportunity is in using these tools to offload some of that work. But I think we've got to be careful in offloading the work onto the technology. We have to be mindful of what we're asking the technology to do and not asking the technology to sort of take over and be the core answer to what matters in teaching and learning. And suddenly what matters is what this technology can do, not what human beings care about, right? Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, in in this arena, you know, Can you the get research to the mic. I'm, I'm the research up. has been, uh, you know, very very uh, varied and and intense in the last what decade, twenty years, if you will. Uh, rigor, you know, styles, uh, student success, those type of topics. A question that always come to mind when when we talk to faculty is um, that X course say my course cannot be taught online mm -hmm. um, and again you know there are like 50 answers so uh, wh what's what's the the truth if you will based on on your experience and maybe your research in terms of a uh, subjects that may not be well suited if if we can label it that way for online mm -hmm. learning we've been asked yeah i've been working in this field uh as a part of the SUNY Learning Network back when that was um, SUNY's system level efforts for online teaching and learning. We're, we worked with 64 different colleges. We spent 100 days a year in face-to-face -face faculty development activities with thousands of faculty over the years. And that question probably was asked at every single engagement that we did by somebody who was new to online learning. In those days, it was like, well, you know, maybe the math uh, and hard sciences are a little bit more difficult to do because of the limits of text-based representation that we had in learning management systems back then. But I think increasingly, the answer to that is, tell me who's not doing online learning in some area. It's being done in basically every discipline on the planet. I get submissions to the journal for obscure disciplinary studies of online uh, learning applied to some discipline I barely knew existed. So I, I don't think there really is a limit on what we can do with online learning as it relates to the disciplinary content. I think it, pretty much any, any subject can be taught online if the course is designed to do it, des designed with uh, learning in mind. So I don't see any right. limits that way. Thank you. So, Dr. Shea, uh, I'm also a, a SUNY Albany alum. Congratulations. Um, Thanks from, for being from here. From your department. <laughs> Good to see you. We have Great, a success. Likewise. Excellent. Um, so, one of the challenges, my 44th year in higher education, and, and um, um, uh, I worked uh, in SUNY and CUNY and, and now in the California State University system, and one of the biggest challenges that I have found is providing safe space for junior faculty who are interested in innovation and development of course material um, online. You know, I, I served, um, when I was provost at Cal Poly Pomona, we, we had focus groups with junior faculty who said, you know, I've been kind of told by my senior faculty that we don't do that here i.e. implying that perhaps through the RTP process, they would be disadvantaged. Yeah. Uh, at CUNY, I was a part of a presidential task force, CUNY-wide, same, same type of uh, feedback. So in your research and in your, your work, is that, um, is that real? Is that, um, you know, I mean, is that something that, in order to move the dial, in order to increase the number of online courses and and uh, online programs. Uh, uh, we t we you talked earlier about student success. How do we ensure that faculty, 
particularly pre-tenured faculty who want to do this space. No one's being, no one's forcing a faculty member to teach an online course, right? Oh. Um, but to provide them with the kind of, of support um, where they will not be impacted negatively in the promotion and reappointment process, tenure promotion and reappointment process. It's a, it's a complex question, a complex topic. I don't think there's any black and white simple answers to this. I, I know um, in, our, my, in the context that I was in at the University of Albany, uh, in the School of Education, in the Department of Educational Theory and Practice, there was definitely a culture that said, that's not for you, don't do that. Focus on your research, focus on your teaching, get your publications, and when you're done with that, you can go into online learning. I think, as you're suggesting, that that represents an, sort of a break on innovation and a break on the expansion of access to higher education. Um, I think the answer is in your provost role to talk about recognition and reward systems and say, you know, this is not a, a, an easy lift, it's a heavy lift, but maybe we should revisit our recognition and reward systems. What gets recognized in tenure and promotion? Does innovation get recognized? Does uh, participation in activities that are important to the advancement of the campus count towards uh, tenure and promotion? If those things matter, then let's make them matter in tenure and promotion considerations. So I think it's, you know, there's a, a certain amount of tension there. We want uh, junior faculty to get tenure, we want junior faculty to be successful, but we also want to expand access to higher education. And, and the way to do it is to integrate the two systems so that we're rewarding what does matter to the institution. So. Other questions? If not, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.